All right, today's talk will be on weed identification presented by John Roncaroni, weed science farm advisor emeritus. John received both his bachelor's degree in environmental policy analysis and planning and his master's degree in horticulture from UC Davis. He worked as a staff research associate in the UC Davis Department of Plant Sciences in all aspects of um, plant. So John has been working in all aspects of weed science um, and uh, for, for 25 years and became a UC Cooperative Extension Weed Science Farm Advisor and UCIPM Affiliate Advisor um, uh, in Napa County in March of 2007, specializing in vineyard weed management. Although he retired in July of 2020, he continues to work with growers, UC Master Gardeners, and other UC Farm Advisors. He also advises the California Sustainable Wine Growers Association and volunteers with the Center for Land-Based Learning in Woodland. So John, take it away. All right, Carrie. Thank you very much. Let me, I'll, I'll share my screen and then uh, get off to a few uh, things here. I just wanted to say uh, welcome. Uh, I'm sure there's a few master gardeners out there that have probably seen me give a presentation before. And you know that one of the things that I like most of all is the interaction that we have. And, and I'm glad I can do this, but, but I really do miss that interaction. Uh, and it's gonna be hard for me, as you probably know, to be sitting in a chair while I do this. And just so you do know that I really still do miss those snacks. So I'm hoping that one of these days I can get out and do those presentations again. Uh, a few things about the presentation today. You can see it's just about identification. Uh, you may have thought it'd be about control, but you know it's a pretty large audience today and I'm not gonna be able to spend all the time uh, that's needed to, to really uh, talk to any one subject about identification. Um, I'm hoping that what I teach you today will help you decide uh, on the weeds that you have, which, I, which uh, method will be the best for you because you know, if I, if I had time to do it, it, there would be some people who want to know how thick their cardboard should be. Others want to know about conventional herbicides, you know, others mulching or organic herbicides, or, you know, some people are in turf, others might be in vineyards. So it's really, I'm hoping that today that I can give you the tools to figure out uh, which method would be best for you. Uh, the other thing, you know, I, I call myself a weed scientist and, and uh, that's what I am. I am not a taxonomist. Um, so if you are a taxonomist or a, even an amateur at tech, uh, taxonomist, you might find yourself cringing through some of my presentation. So um, I had to sort of reteach myself uh, with some help of some, a good friend, uh, Jody Tommaso and others uh, in uh, the weed science group, how to identify weeds, because mostly after 38 years of weed science, uh, I learned a lot of them by rote, by seeing them every day. So uh, I knew what they were. And oftentimes when you know something like that, it's hard to teach other people. So I think I've, I've gone back and taught myself, but hopefully these will help you. And these are what I use. And there's also going to be a few weed science uh, just some ideas that you may not get uh, uh, somewhere else. So we'll go with that. Question I get most often is, you know, what is a weed? You know, is a, is a weed uh, just a, uh, is a weed always a weed or is it just a, a plant out of place? Well, we have some annual bluegrass, you know, uh, in a garden competing with your winter vegetables. Um, is a weed, I need to get rid of this. All I see is myself here, there we go. Uh, in a golf course in Monterey, if managed, it's, it's not a bad putting service. Yellow star thistle. Usually a weed in rangeland, but early in the season and in a very uh, dry year, maybe the only feed until it's too prickly for cattle, sheep and goats, but not for horses. Doing some work years ago with, with Jody Tommaso, we wanted to go through and clean out an entire area uh, to see what was there. And, and the grower said, you know, you need to leave some of the star thistle because right now it's pretty much my only feed. Poison oak, you know, undesirable along a plant trail. Of course it is but can be an important food source uh, for wildlife. Tree of Heaven, now this is a, a sort of an interesting one. There really are some beautiful specimen trees of Tree of Heaven. But if you cut that thing, uh, there are sprouting roots that will, are, are out for about 50 feet in all directions. Uh, and then I found out later from my entomology 
friends that it's uh, can be a host for spotted lanternfly, which is a, a, a dangerous uh, invasive pest. And then maybe the best example of all, Bermuda grass. You know, it can be a low maintenance, drought tolerant lawn in the uh, in a lawn, uh, but in your garden, uh, I think it's just it is a nightmare in your garden, uh, just because it is such a, a tough weed to to control. So are some plants more likely to be weeds more than others? Uh, the answer, of course, is yes. And, and this is a, a slide I like to use just to show um, some of those uh, characteristics that make a plant more suited to be a weed or, or, or I guess worse to be a weed. You know, here, uh, I was going to go over each of them, but uh, in the interest of time, I, I won't. But here, like rapid growth through the vegetative phase to flowering. So it's not wasting time a lot of times uh, with a lot of vegetative growth. It just wants to flower and seed. Um, being able to, to self-cross when needed, but also be able to intermix uh, to, uh, to get that hybrid uh, vigor. Uh, very high seed, seed output in favorable oh, full environmental conditions. Uh, adaptations for short distance and long distance dispersal. Star thistle is, is a great example. And uh, here, 11, if perennial bitterness, sorry, brittleness, so as not to be drawn from the ground easily. Well, I go back to dandelion, right? You know that that's why there's a whole industry of dandelion knives, maybe not a big industry, but um, you really can't pull it out of the ground very easily. So this is one too. Why should I care what it is if it's a weed? Well, a couple things. One, you need to know what weed it is to get the proper method of control. If you're using chemicals, choosing the right chemical. And I mean by this, if you're using a pre-emergent herbicide on a perennial plant, it's probably not going to work at all. If you think it's a, if it's a grass, but it's actually a nutsedge, that grass herbicide will not work. So, um, and if it's a broadleaf and you think it's a grass or vice versa, you may be choosing the wrong chemical. And anytime you spraying a chemical that has no chance of working, it really is just a waste uh, of chemical and uh, something you shouldn't do in the environment. Physical control. Now, this is interesting too. And I get this question a lot. Will I spread it by cultivation? Well, can I pull it? Do I need to dig it out? Can I use a weed eater? You know, if you use a weed eater on Bermuda grass at some points, you may actually make it worse by spreading it. Um, will mulch control it? Or, and the big question is, is will I make it worse? And I got this question just the other day about Johnson grass, which we'll, I'll show you some pictures and talk about later, that pulling out Johnson grass just doesn't do any good. Uh, you need to actually dig out those rhizomes and, and you'll see why uh, in some future slides here. Timing. Physically, you usually want to get things out early, especially with annual plants. If you're using chemicals, sometimes with perennials, later may be more effective for systemic chemicals. And finally, uh, prioritizing resources. We usually have a limited amount of time and or money. Uh, example is this uh, Center for Land-Based Learning that I volunteer with. Now, uh, a lot of these, these people get a, they're, they're leasing some of them a half acre of, of land and they're trying to learn to be farmers. Uh, they're either full-time or part-time students. Uh, they don't have uh, unlimited resources. So my job working with them is to go out with them and, and point out which weeds need to be uh, controlled right now, such as Johnson grass or maybe Bermuda grass, and while others, maybe annual bluegrass or some other uh, weeds that they can do later. And I think, you know, people just see weeds, they get out and they start to pull them out or, or, or uh, some other sort of method. And the problem is, is that they take, they start at one end and they go to the other. And by the time they get there, maybe the perennial weeds or the worst weeds may have already spread. So you really need to prioritize uh, which weeds need to be controlled now and which ones, which maybe aren't as big a problem or can be controlled easier later. So another question, and I've had this from several uh, different uh, places, is why control weeds? Now, the examples I'm going to give here are, are for urban setting. Um, when I'm talking to my uh, vineyard clientele, there are other reasons for controlling weeds. 
one. Now competition. Now this is semi-urban. This is your backyard garden for your master gardeners. And I don't think when you have a situation like this, as you can see down in this right-hand corner, the grasses have completely taken over in that corner. But you can see, I think it's chickweed and some other weeds in here. I think you understand why you, you have to control weeds in this situation. You're going to be competing with a lot of these plants and some uh, and not just get the yield that you want. Some plants, if you can control weeds early, then you don't need to control them later. Others you may need to control throughout the season. Aesthetics. Now, you know, uh, it is one of the reasons that people control weeds. Now you can see here from this ad, uh, this house is for sale. And it's maybe a difference of quite a few thousand dollars in situations just for that curb appeal. Uh, I know it's not always as important reason to a lot of people to control weeds, but in certain situations like this, uh, it may be. And then here on the right, you can see it just the, the weeds sort of take away from the natural beauty or even the man-made beauty uh, of this little creek on the side here. Trap unsightly trash and debris. Now this is interesting. You know, uh, this is a very urban area. It's like, uh, something you might see. My daughter lives in New York City. Uh, and this is something where by having the weeds like this, they go in while people shouldn't be throwing their trash out. It does collect on these weeds. Um, and then I think people get maybe having a little less good feeling about their neighborhood. It starts to then beget more weeds, which then uh, makes it worse. Uh, obviously, it'd be better if people didn't throw trash out. And, uh, but they just can be a, sort of a, a visual hindrance here. Accelerate the breakdown of pavement. And you can see this uh, here, there's the weeds growing in the cracks here. And this is coyote bush pushing through some pavement. Uh, coyote bush is a native uh, and it just didn't like the idea of being paved over in this situation. Um, three or four years ago, I was called out to the county of Napa airport. They were trying to control weeds and, they, and the, the method they were using wasn't working. They asked me to help because they were having real trouble with an older uh, airstrip and had weeds and, and apparently uh, pilots and the FAA like a smooth place to land. So we worked on some new control methods for the, for the weeds in their uh, airstrip uh, and hopefully would stop uh, breaking down the pavement. Hinder visibility. Now you can see here that this is a, a, a traffic situation and this is some tall grasses, which may or may not be a problem, can be mowed down. Imagine that these are shrubs, uh, a scotch broom or something. So. You know, always can be a problem uh, with just uh, visual uh, hindering visibility. Impact human health. Here we have poison oak and uh, ragweed for, you know, uh, dermal and then uh, people who are allergic to it. I put up here the flowers like in, uh, and the bees because I am one of those people who have to carry a uh, EpiPen. Uh, I was, at least as a child, very, very allergic to, to honeybees. So there's always that impact that, uh, of, of weeds that people always don't think about. Now, maybe when you see poison oak, you think about it immediately, but not the others. Fire. You know, it's been tough for me uh, working a lot on the, uh, on the North Coast. Uh, and now just being in Northern California, I always think it's, you know, maybe too soon after the fire to talk about these things, but it always seems like now it's too soon after a fire. But, you know, we really do have to think about these sorts of things of, um, keeping the weeds down on the roadsides um, and around power lines and those sorts of things. And, and sometimes weeds come in the form of large trees, uh, depending on how the, uh, the forest is managed. Promote other pests, uh, rodents and, and insects. And here I, I use rodents in this, the, the smaller picture here is of um, some field voles in uh, uh, in a vineyard, we were trying to do some cover crop work and you can see the weeds there. Any place that these rodents can hide uh, makes it easier for them to, to uh, live. So having uh, an area like uh, weeds growing around your house uh, really make it difficult to control these guys. So now the part that you came for, uh, how to identify weeds. So you can use keys. And here we have the Jepson manual uh, and, and MUNS. And, and like I said before, I am not a taxonomist. You have to really know all the parts of the plant to really get to, to use one of these dichotomous keys. Here's a close up and a really bad picture. And like I, I like to say, this is what a taxonomist uses to ID plants, you know, and heck, most of the time the flower parts, I don't even remember. Because as a weed scientist, this is what I have to use to control weeds. As I've told several people, 
You know, if I went out to a grower's field who asked me to come out and help identify weeds, if I said, well, I need to wait until it flowers, uh, until I can tell you what to do, uh, he probably wouldn't be real happy. Use keys plus pictures. Good if you know the family characteristics. And I'm, I'm pushing my good friend Jody Tomaso's book, The Weeds of California, Other Western States. These are uh, a two volume set. It's a really excellent resource. And you really need to, to get down to the to where you know the families. And if you look at these books, they can be a little intimidating, but if you look at from the side, they're all color coded. And if you realize that what you're working with is not a, uh, a grass or Poiesae family, and you look, you can see that uh, a lot of the, the, uh, the book is taken up by some larger sections. Use an online expert system, and there may be more, but I'm very familiar with this one at the Weed Research and Information Center. You see here, when you go to the homepage, you'll see this toolbar on the side. And here we have the Weed ID tool. There are some other educational things you can have here. Once you go in there, uh, you find this, and then you go and you search the location. And now we have several states. Um, and in fact, it may, instead of saying University of California, it may still say University of Wisconsin, uh, because it was um, co-authored by Jody Tommaso and Dr. Mark Renz up at West, uh, University of Wisconsin, who was Joe's graduate student several years ago. So you pick your state, pick the kind of weed, then you hit broadleaf, you go, and then you'll get this sheet here, uh, and it will ask you several questions. Now, the big thing about this one is you don't put any answers in that you don't know. So you may not have the uh, flower, so you don't put in flower color. And these little question marks here, those will help explain to you uh, what the, if you don't know what petioles are, hopefully after today, you'll know a little better. And these are all drop down menus. And then when you're done, you hit uh, uh, select and it'll come up with a few pictures. Uh, maybe depending on how close you get, uh, 10 to 15 pictures. Um, and that's a whole lot easier than going through those, those big books, but at least it'll give you a, uh, an area to start. And, and some of these, you know, uh, one I wanna make sure that you do see is uh, leaf hairs. You have to look very closely because if you put in that it has hairs and it doesn't, sometimes that'll get you way off the track. So there are others out there, but this is one that I'm familiar with. So I get a lot of questions about the apps, uh, plant ID apps, and I don't use them at all. Uh, I still get some uh, pleasure out of trying to identify a plant. And I always can call uh, Jody Tommaso if I, uh, <laughs> or send him a note saying, I can't identify the show. Can you help me? But um, so I reached out to my good friend, Dr. Lynn Sosnowski, who's now at Cornell. She was in California for several years. And I know that she's done, um, worked with these quite a bit. So I just really took the email that she sent me and just put it here. Um, she is mostly focused on, on PlantNet and iNaturalist. They're better when identifying mature plants, particularly if flowers are present, obviously. Uh, she suggests that people minimize background distraction when taking pictures, submitting multiple pics of different plants. So, and always double check against a reputable source uh, because the databases are crowdsourced and incorrect IDs beget additional incorrect IDs. So, you know, you can use these as a start, but make sure you, once you get close, that maybe you go to another source and try to get down to exactly what it is. So how do you identify weeds? So here we have different weeds, broadleaves, which like oxalis, uh, we have sedges with triangular stems, especially a good example for us is yellow nut sedge. Grasses, you know, narrow leaves, parallel veins, rounder flat stems. And here we have large crabgrass uh, and Dallas grass. And we'll get more into this a little bit later. So what's interesting is that sometimes people don't, just uh, miss the obvious clues when they're identifying plants. So you may not know what this one is. Um, but what, what got me is I took this picture, and here you see this is this same plant as it moves along, uh, growing uh, in this large old bush. Now, you probably know Russian thistle or tumbleweed. Um, and when you see it growing, remember that for next year, that this is where it came from. So parts of the plant, we just basically start with some, some ID. We have the blade of the leaf, the blade, the petiole, and then the stipule down here. We can have a simple leaf or a compound leaf. And we have those, we have the compound leaves. We have a trifoliate here like clover, palmate like sink foil and a pinnate again, like artemisia or ragweed. And then leaf arrangement. They're either alternate or world opposite or like our old friend dandelion having coming from that basal uh, rosette. 
And here we have bed straw with those world leaves. And I think you all know bed straw. It's the one you like to put on your shirt and it hooks. So that's what a world leaf arrangement looks like. And again, as I said, dandelion with those leaves coming straight out of a basal rosette. Chickweed. Now, these leaves are opposite all the way up. Two here, two here. Square stems, bed straw, henbit, and whorehound. Now you can see, and this is a great characteristic, you can roll them in your fingers and see that they're square or feel that they're square, uh, exactly. Now leaf shapes. Now I'm not expecting that you, and I don't think a lot of times they even ask for leaf shape anymore. But one of the things that I do like to uh, have people at least realize that there are leaf shapes. Now, I know that sounds ridiculous, but they're not just different shaped leaves, like orbicular leaf, which you'll see here soon, and kidney shaped, and chordate, heart shaped. Oftentimes, these will lead you uh, to identify what family these weeds are in. Not always, but often it will. And you can see here, the mustards are brassica. They have these kidney-shaped cotyledons. Now, they're not the only ones and maybe not all of them, but the ones that I'm familiar with, at least it gets you started that way. Mallow family. So, you know, the cheese weeds. And here, velvet leaf. You can see this heart-shaped cotyledon. And I'll tell you what, if you're trying to control some of these mallows, this is the best time to start before they get big and woody because they are annual uh, they can stay for, become short-lived perennials. And getting them out now is a much better time uh, than, than trying to do that later. Uh, leaf uh, leaves here, we have either an entire leaf with no sort of serrations in it. Uh, but and, and then we have the other ones that are rounded, toothed, lobed, or feathered. And, and I used to keep all of these equal, but uh, I think in a lot of, um, IDs now, especially the one that Dr. D. Tommaso has from the weed rick, it either says, is it entire or does it have some kind of toothing? So all you have to know is if there are, is no toothing, if it's smooth or not. And we have weeds here like groundsel, which have these toothings from a very young age, the very first true leaves all the way through. And then of course, because they're weeds, they're going, oh, sorry, I need to go back one. Because they're weeds, they're going to try and throw us off. Now, you can see that this is not entire, and, and this is prickly lettuce. So it's not, it does have some toothing. And this is also a prickly lettuce plant with these huge lobes. Uh, these may not show up on the same plant, maybe early in, in a stage, but they can be in the same field and are the same plant. But again, learning certain characteristics, once you know a weed, for me, the easiest way to identify prickly lettuce is by these prickles down the mid vein on under the, underneath the leaf, on the underside of the leaf. And other things like petty spurge, uh, being a euphorbia, this latex. And you know that we have plants that, you know, like you have, probably have ornamental euphorbs at home, but they have this really not very showy flower and they do have this latex. Now be careful, a lot of people are, can be allergic uh, to this latex. So a grass identification, uh, and I do spend a, a, a little time here on uh, grass ID. Um, and I'm just going to go over this real quickly. The leaf is composed of the sheath and the blade. Uh, the sheath encloses the stem and is connected to the blade at the junction uh, found by the collar. The collar is located on the outer side of the leaf, and the ligule is located on the inner side of the leaf. The auricles are the appendages uh, around the stem from both sides of the collar. Joints in the stem are called nodes. Uh, the part between any two nodes is called the inner node. Here you see here the parts of a plant, the blade, uh, the stolons, the root system, and of course here, uh, the rhizomes. Then we have here a, a pencil drawing of the ligule, the auricles here, uh, the sheath, and then of course the leaf blade. So uh, here are just pictures uh, of auricles. 
And again, coming up. So now these, the things that you have to understand about oracles is they don't stay uh, on the plants for a long time. So they are very, very thin. And oftentimes when the plant starts to uh, mature, uh, we'll find that they, they really uh, will, will not be there. But by the time that that happens on a lot of these plants, uh, you're going to find that um, there has a seed head and you have to be able to uh, identify the seed heads. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's important later. So I like to show this, uh, and I like to do this in person because I do it with hand signals. But here we have oats. Uh, this is These are all the, the tame or, or cultivated plants. Oats, wheat in the middle, uh, and then barley here on the right. And you can see just by looking at these, uh, the oracles. Here there are none, really nothing here. On wheat, they are very short. And then here on barley, they're clasping or they wrap around uh, the stem. When we, when we, we take out, uh, just to have the leaf blade back here, you'll see that these are the ligules. Now again, uh, important for identification of grasses, um, long and papery, fairly short, and then ripped. You know, I like to tell, and then again, the articles here, short and then clasping. You know, I like to tell people that uh, while this isn't a taxonomy class, why is it even important that uh, we can identify um, weeds in the uh, grasses in the vegetative stage? Well, if you're in an area that maybe has fire has come through or you're worried about uh, erosion, you may want not to take out all the grasses uh, in that field or on that side of the hill. So I think it's important that, and you'll see why some of these weeds are, are really not um, as desirable as others, especially if you have livestock or, or dogs uh, that uh, may re run into problems with some of these weeds. So um, being able to identify them early as to this is, a, this is a grass that I would like to keep as opposed to one that you'll want to get rid of. And, and I'll show you some examples of those uh, coming up here. So uh, here we can see on this plant, and uh, it is hair barley, uh, the auricles right here. And this is nice because I found a spot that had the seed head and uh, the identifying auricles here of long and clasping. So, and this is one of the, the, the reasons that you wanna be able to identify a, a plant early, and I'll show you some pictures later. But here we have a plant that one, oats or two plants, oats, and then uh, ripcut brome, and they both have a fairly long papery ligule. And you can see here that the ripcut brome's ligule is, is a little bit longer. But one of the things you'll find out is that while oats um, are not glabrous or even wild oats, they're not completely hairless. They have very, very few hairs. But one of the characteristics of the ripcut brome are these long hairs and especially the stiff hairs along the edge of the, of the blade here. And you'll see why you may want to keep something like wild oats uh, as opposed to rip gut brome. So here's wild oats. Again, yes, there are some seed heads and yes, these may be a problem with for your dog or for, for livestock, but this is actually a, a fairly desirable weedy grass. Uh, we also have uh, slender uh, oats, uh, which are just not quite as healthy looking as these, but these are easily taken down. Actually, you can grow these and put them back even as, uh, as a mulch sometimes. So this is ripcut brome. And the thing about this one is any of these, the ons along here uh, are barbed with what, what appear to be like the teeth on a snake, sort of backwards facing. So they can go into an ear or into an eye, but they will not come back out. So it really is, um, you know, you want to try and get rid of this weed as early as possible by identifying it by that long, uh, fairly paper, paper <laughs> easy for you to say, papery ligule uh, and no articles and then those hairs. So this is one that you probably would not want to keep. In, and before it gets to this stage, once these are dry, it's really a problem. Annual ryegrass or perennial ryegrass, or, you know, it's... Uh, it was uh, for years uh, in, in uh, one species, in one genus, and now moved to another genus. And the geneticists tell us that 
that the annual uh, ryegrass has uh, uh, bred with the perennial ryegrass. So there's all different kinds of species. No one that is, is uh, uh, resistant to several different herbicides. And it's a very aggressive uh, of grass. And I tell people that, you know, when we're all gone, it'll be cockroaches climbing on, on ryegrass. But, uh, and I'm a little wary anytime ryegrass is planted, but I can tell you one thing, if, if I was on that same side of a hill worried about erosion and I needed some, something in there very quickly, I would plant ryegrass uh, without a hesitation because it adapts well, it moves in well. Uh, we may have to control it later, but uh, it's a very, um, very adaptive grass and a quick grower. Uh, but you can see here, the seed head's completely different. Very, no or very few hairs. And, and it's always the shiniest grass. And I get you, ta you taxonomists, I'm sure, cringing now. But it's always the shiniest grass uh, in that area. So some weed biology. Uh, this is also very important. And, I, and I'll be going through this fairly quickly. Uh, so we have time for some questions at the end. But not only knowing what the weeds are, but knowing when they grow is so important or how they grow. So here we have control annual weeds before they spread. So if you have some small weeds like the annual bluegrass uh, or spotted spurge or sow thistle, you want to dig those out. Or This is annual bluegrass, I'm sorry, bef uh, and, and crabgrass. Uh, dig them out early on. You might as well uh, uh, just get them out. So, and this is also interesting too. So uh, we have a weed like this uh, gone to the end. Well, I'm not really worried about this old flea bane plant. Well, you should be. These were found under those plants again. And if you know flea bane, it's become just a menace in, in gardens. And again, the, uh, those people who are uh, in the fields who, who may still be using something like glyphosate, uh, it's completely resistant. Uh, it just won't kill it. And, and this one gets up and you can see from that picture, one plant can produce several thousand weeds, seeds and weeds. Perennials. So the interesting thing about perennials, again, if you're using systemic chemicals, say on Bermuda grass, uh, something like a, a grass specific herbicide, you may want to do it, you may want to spray somewhere in here so we can get that herbicide back down into the roots. Uh, but the other thing is, is you, you're gonna have to try and get it before it matures and then sends out these rhizomes because it does it. Some of these plants do it at very, very quickly. They don't have to grow a lot before they start sending out these. So we have a couple different times types of perennials. Um, and simple perennials are oftentimes the ones that people like to talk about as herbs. Uh, reproduce primarily from seed, generally do not re reproduce from roots. However, can reproduce from roots if segments of the roots are, are cut up or broken off. And, and that would be dandelion. You know, this is the kind of weed that, yes, it, it, it sort of spreads out and there can be, but it usually spreads by seed. So this one, you know, if you want to have a few dandelion plants in your backyard, you're going to want to cut these seed heads off, but they won't be too bad. Curly dock, kind of the same way. You have to watch out for the seed heads. Uh, plantain and uh, buckhorn plantain and, and broadleaf plantain are problems I know oftentimes in turf and, and in a few gardens, but, but they're not going to be spreading like some of the other creeping perennials, which are, are much worse weeds. Creeping perennials are easy, the, the worst weeds. Uh, they can spread by seed, by creeping roots, by rhizomes, by stolons, by tubers. And if you're uh, uh, if you're Bermuda grass, you use them all. Well, maybe no tubers, but there are sedges, grasses, and broadleaf creeping perennials. So I talk a lot about Johnson grass, and a lot of places don't have Johnson grass, but here in the Central Valley, uh, we have lots of Johnson grass. And you can see each one of these little things here is uh, a Johnson grass uh, segment of its rhizome, and they already have roots starting. Bermuda grass, pretty much the same way. Uh, you cut it up, and it's going to start growing. So again, here's the Johnson grass. You know, these are like crab legs out here. Each of these segments is, is then uh, ready to root. So I took this uh, a couple years ago when I uh, first wasn't able, I guess about a year and a half ago, I wasn't able to go out and do a master gardener presentation. And these were some Johnson grass coming back in early spring. Well, you can see these are already, and this one's already starting to root. So getting through with something like a rototiller on something like this would just make this worse. So again, knowing what the weed is, knowing how it grows, will help you know what to do as far as, as management. Spraying this or digging it out, you can't just chop this off. It will do no good. You may eventually uh, starve it, but it's going to be uh, a long way to go that way. 
and bindweed, field bindweed, um, this problem. The interesting thing about a picture like this, uh, as scary as it may be, the thing about this, when I ask people in person, what else do they see growing in this field? And they'll say nothing. Well, those of you who have ever seen this plant growing in, in deep valley soils like we have here, know that the, the uh, rhizomes and uh, roots grow down, uh, spreading roots go down about six to eight feet, maybe more. So anytime you're just disking the top of a field, you're actually taking out all the competition, any grasses that may be growing to compete with this plant and just letting it go uh, wild. Uh, so that's one of the things that should never be done. It, I tell people, you know, it, it's, it's like trying to, to cure a heart attack with a Band-Aid on your arm. Uh, it just really does no good. You really need to try and, and, and either one, stop disking the top, maybe try and pull it out, do some covers. Uh, and actually, this may be a, a, a situation in this agricultural situation for a systemic herbicide to really sort of get back to, to the start. So uh, nutsedge, now this is yellow nutsedge and, and nutsedge can be a real problem. Uh, this one is not nearly as big a problem as purple nutsedge is because of the way that the nutlets are, are uh, come off of the plant. Uh, but again, still this one. So these are the perennating structures. If you can pull the plant, if you can pull nutsedge out early, then you're good. If not, then these are going to start. The other thing too, is that you can pull this one. And if these germinate without sending out uh, uh, more roots with, with more nutlets, then you can actually control it if you stay on it. But you really have to, you really shouldn't let it get too established. So I think with that, so I know that that was fairly quick and, and we are getting to the point where I wanted to leave enough time for uh, not so much your questions, but those of you who know me, I know that even your, if your questions are short, uh, I don't have any short answers. Um, but I really want to make sure that you know that you can go um, to the UCIPM uh, website for pest notes uh, and um, quick tips. And here you see a quick tip in, uh, this is for peach leaf coral, but some of the weeds have these, but these are the, the, the dandelion. We talk a lot about identification and life cycle and how to control them. The best uh, uh, physical control, uh, there are some chemicals in these. And for those of you maybe who are, are, are more uh, in the uh, agricultural side, here's uh, the um, uh, pest management guideline for turf grass and for lettuce and for a lot of the other crops. You know, they are, they are not written for the homeowner, but for some people who may have come in today and, and are looking for certain things like this, this is uh, really another uh, avenue to go for uh, information. So conclusions uh, and some questions. So hopefully, you know, like I said, it's a fairly short uh, presentation. I want to make sure that we did have time for questions or again, for my answers. <laughs> One, so is a weed always a weed? Well, no, some weeds can be managed in a way so they're, they can be useful to us. But some plants are more likely to be weedy than others. Uh, and just know that when you're trying to use them. Remember that every weed can be controlled through physical means. And uh, that may be hand pulling, it may be hoeing or digging, it may be a chainsaw, it may be bulldozers. You really can control them, it just may take a little bit more. It is important to identify weeds correctly and understand their biology to manage them effectively and efficiently, both for your time and for the environment. So if you're, if you're spraying, oftentimes people who do spray, don't know the weeds they're spraying and they may actually be resistant. It may be the wrong species and you're just, you're, you're wasting. So it just makes more sense to know exactly the weed, at least approximately the weed uh, and the biology of when it grows, if that, if what you're putting out there is helpful or not. And finally, every weed can be controlled. It's just a matter of time and money. So with that, I just want to say thank you for listening.